All right, in chapter 42, this is going to talk about gas exchange and how the lungs are involved in, um, you know, the ventilation process, gas exchange, uh, bringing oxygen into the bloodstream and getting rid of the CO2 that's being produced, okay? So um, the respiratory surfaces, these are specialized uh, um, for gas exchange. They're extremely thin. There's a couple types of cells that are um, involved, and they're constantly bathed in a moist medium that's going to speed up this uh, um, diffusion rate of these gases through um, the, from the air into these and through these cells and then into the bloodstream to the um, the red blood cells and then from the red blood cells again through this moist medium and then into um, the alveoli or the air sacs where they can be um, uh, uh, you know exhaled from the body okay so the lungs, of course, these are the respiratory organs, and they've got a dense network of capillaries. So there's lots and lots of blood being able to um, flow through there and rapidly exchange the gases, get rid of the CO2, bring in the oxygen that's needed. And it does so, um, you know, over this uh, respiratory epithelium, these two different types of cells, the type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes that are there. And... Um, what they're going to do is kind of the, a, a structure function type of a thing. So this is where gas exchange has to occur. So there's got to be a lot of blood flow and there's got to be a lot of surface area. And so if we look at the picture here, you can see um, it's got this spongy appearance to it. So these alveoli, these tiny uh, ended sacs that are kind of um, encapsulated with the uh, capillaries, which is where this gas exchange is actually occurring. Okay, so your air pathway now um, consists of the nares, um, the pharynx, the larynx, trachea, bronchii, bronchioles, and the alveoli. So it's, it's a lot like an upside down tree. And from your nose into your lungs, the surface area is getting greater and greater. And the, the three main kind of um, branches of the, the uh, respiratory system are covered with um, cilia and mucus so that they can trap the things that we're breathing in and they can help kind of um, sweep them out. Um, you know, so with the help of the immune system to really try to help us uh, um, stay healthy. Okay, so this mucus is going to trap um, particles, pathogens, things like that, and then the cilia um, are going to beat in a direction to kind of force it up and out so that we, um, you know, can cough it out, we can um, blow our nose and, and have it come out, those types of things. So, um, again, the structure function relationship not only does it have really thin membranes uh, bathed in water, but a lot of these uh, membranes have. Uh, or, or, or airways have the ciliated um, kind of mucus lined um, you know, pa uh, pathway so that we can help um, keep ourselves healthy. Now the thinnest bronchioles, these are the dead end sacs and they almost look like a bunch of grapes. They've got, they're called alveoli, they've got a very high surface area and of course they're um, kind of encapsulated by the uh, capillary beds. Okay, so um, lung, uh, excuse me, the air gets carried into the lungs through of course your nasal cavity, through your oral cavity if you're breathing through your mouth, um, through your larynx and your trachea. And then once they get to the bronchioles or, and the bronchii, this is where they start to um, separate out and then it's getting smaller and smaller once it gets down into um, the alveoli of the individual bronchioles. And that's where the gas exchange is going to take place. So this, uh, these alveoli, these kind of spongy um, cells uh, or structures are, are consisting of two types of cells. You've got the type 1 and the type 2 pneumocytes. Okay? So when you look at these type 1 pneumocytes, these are extremely thin and they're adapted to carry out the gas exchange. So, so they've got you know, a, a nucleus in them, but the cell body is really kind of small when you compare it to that of the type 2. So here, um, if we go back and just look at the type 2 that are on here, you can see that they've got a much bigger um, cell body as well as uh, you know, the nucleus and a bunch of organelles and things like that. And because what these things are designed to do is create this surfactant, which is this um, you know, uh, thin, kind of uh, moist layer that's going to help reduce the uh, surface tension on the cells and allow the, the gas exchange to occur and prevent the uh, lungs really from collapsing on themselves and, and adhering to each other because then that would be bad and you wouldn't get the gas exchange and things like that. So the type 1 are really thin. They allow for gas exchange. Type 2 are a little bit thicker, have bigger cell bodies, and, and they're involved in making the surfactant that uh, bathes the lungs. All right. Okay, so with the, um, with the air pathway, the oxygen is very quickly going to dissolve into that moist film. And then the dense web of capillaries is going to be where this really this gas exchange is going to take place with the help of the, the red blood cells kind of dropping these things off. So the oxygen is going to diffuse from high to low. 
the uh, CO2 is going to diffuse in the opposite direction from low um, from uh, low high excuse me high to low so in other words when you're breathing in air you've got a high concentration of oxygen relative to the amount of co2 and then as that blood is flowing through your lungs um, through and over the alveoli the carbon dioxide level is high relative to the atmosphere so they're going to diffuse in opposite directions the high concentration of co2 in the blood is going to diffuse to the low concentration in the alveoli and then the high concentration of oxygen in the alveoli is going to um, be uh, diffusing into the low concentration in the blood and that's how that blood is going to get reoxygenated as it flows through the lungs. So when you talk about the diffusion of a gas it depends a lot on the partial pressures. So when we just kind of look here at this picture here just for relative terms we put the um, the oxygen percentage in the alveolus at 100. Of course the atmospheric oxygen level um, is not 100 but just for the, the um, sake of ease what happens is as you can see the incoming blood there at the top of the figure has a low concentration of oxygen relative to that in the alveolus and so as it's flowing around the alveoli those cells of course which are primed for gas exchange the oxygen being high in the alveolus is going to diffuse into the bloodstream and the CO2 levels, which are high in the bloodstream and low in the alveolus, are going to diffuse out. So you can see that's kind of the exchange there. And when, when water gets exposed to any gas, like the water that's bathing our, our respiratory media, for medium, for instance, what happens is, is the gases are going to dissolve into the water proportional to um, the partial pressure that's there because they're soluble in these things. So gases, of course, are always going to diffuse from high pressure, high partial pressure, to low partial pressure. So that's kind of what's happening inside of our lungs. Now with the act of breathing, what's happening is, is we've got these muscle contractions which are causing pressure changes inside of our chest cavity or our thorax here. And this is going to force air in and out of the lungs, allowing us to, of course, ventilate them. And the muscles, the main muscles that are involved that we went over in class are the diaphragm, the external intercostal muscles and the internal intercostal muscles. And that, that, that intercostal, the costal is really referring to the ribs. So the external are on the outside, the internal are on the inside, and then the diaphragm, of course, is at the base of the ribs. All right. And these different muscles are required for inspiration or inhaling, expiration or exhaling. And the muscles are only going to do work when they're contracting. So when people breathe, what happens is, is their diaphragm is contracting and it's, it's making the chest cavity bigger and it's lowering the pressure inside the lungs as it gets bigger and then the high atmospheric pressure is going to get forced into the lungs. And then the opposite is true when, when, the, when we breathe out. Um, when we exhale, the diaphragm relaxes and then that kind of makes the chest cavity smaller and forces the air out. So the pressure inside the chest cavity is higher relative to the atmospheric pressure. So this, the, the, this is the way in which the diaphragm works. So now when we look at the external intercostal muscles, what's happening is, is when we breathe, and there are a number of other muscles involved, but for our purposes, the diaphragm is contracting, making the chest cavity larger. The external intercostal muscles are um, contracting and helping to make the uh, uh, chest cavity larger to assist that diaphragm. And in doing so, again, you're lowering the pressure inside the chest cavity relative to the surroundings. And then that's allowing the air to, to be forced in. Okay. The intercostal muscles now, these are going to work when the diaphragm relaxes. And this is the internal and external are really working a lot when we're breathing hard, like from exercising and such. Um, but the internal intercostal muscles, when they contract, they're kind of pulling the chest cavity down. They're helping make it smaller, increasing the pressure relative to the surroundings and forcing the air out of the lungs. So humans have what we refer to as negative pressure breathing. And what happens is, is we're going to lower the pressure inside of our chest cavity to allow the atmospheric pressure to force that air in. And so when we speak of breathing, we talk about a tidal volume, kind of the in and out movement of the air. And the max kind of um, uh, volume of breathing is between um, three and, you know, almost five liters of air. So, you know, that's, that's as big and as small, really, as you can make your chest cavity. And then any remaining air um, in the lungs after a forced exhale, you've gotten rid of everything you can, uh, is referred to as the residual volume, the residual or what's left over. All right. So now with breathing... Breathing is mostly under autonomic control. In other words, we're not thinking about doing it. And what happens is, is the, the 
there's a lot of biological kind of indicators that are going on to help you increase or decrease your breathing rate. And there's two main reason, regions of your brain that are going to control this. You've got the pons and you've got the medulla. And the pons controls the medulla and the medulla sets that base, basic breathing rate. And it's, you know, it's at the, the base of the brain. It's the most basic biological types of functions. And you've got sensors, which we referred to in an earlier chapter, which are going to sense the changes in CO2, the changes in oxygen levels, pH, and uh, they, they're going to set the breathing rate based on that. And we want to make sure that our pH is between 7.35 and 7.45, really right in that set point. And the pH of our blood is largely controlled by CO2 levels. So as the CO2 levels get too high, our pH drops and we start breathing harder so we can get rid of that CO2 and we can set our pH back or keep it within that kind of set point in that range. And when the CO2 levels increase, of course, we said that the pH drops and that's because the carbonic acid levels are increasing. And when this pH drops now, we've got to start getting rid of the CO2 so that we can, you know, again, control that pH. And we said also earlier, and we talked about this in class, only at high altitudes is where oxygen really has a low, uh, an effect on the breathing rate. Normally, it doesn't have much of an effect um, on our breathing rate at all. Okay, so in addition to transporting the oxygen, we've said, you know, all, all last year and such that uh, hemoglobin also helps uh, in the transport of the CO2 and assists in the buffering because the respiring cells that are producing the CO2, that's going to lower the pH and we've got carbonic anhydrase, which is a very, very fast working enzyme that's going to help catalyze the reaction of the CO2 and water to form this carbonic acid, which will very quickly dissociate into hydrogen ions and um, bicarbonate ions, which diffuse into the plasma and the red blood cells. You can see the, the hydrogen ions attach mostly to the hemoglobin and that's helping buffer some of the pH. And then um, the, the HCO3, the bicarbonate ion, is going to diffuse into the plasma where it's going to be carried back um, to the lungs. And as the blood flows through the lungs now, we're going to reverse this process. So in the lungs, this is where we're going to dump off the CO2. The CO2 diffuses out of the blood cells and into the alveolus where the concentration is low. And carbonic anhydrase, of course, is going to help with this conversion to make sure that it occurs very, very rapidly so that we're efficiently um, oxygenating our, our bloodstream and getting rid of the, the CO2 waste that's been produced. And that shift uh, is the Le Chatelier's principle that we talked about earlier last year um, where we're... we're um, kind of counteracting the stress on the system. When the CO2 levels are high, we move it to keep them uh, low. And when we get to the lungs, we're kind of uh, forcing a lot of this out, kind of to minimize that stress on the system, okay? And the key to the gas exchange, of course, is this reversible reaction that we went over a lot in class. And if you have any questions on it, please make sure that you write them down. We talk about it in class, okay? So that pretty much takes care of the breathing. If you've got anything that uh, you're concerned with, uh, please, again, um, see me in class. We'll uh, address it as a class and make sure that everybody has um, what they need to make sense of all this. Okay, so we'll see you soon.